Um, so what I want to talk about are two, I mean, this is partly growing out of the book that I just finished and published that Kathleen was um, uh, kind enough to refer to. So I'll draw on that book freely, but also share with you some of the ideas I've had since uh, the publication of the book. And I want to address the question of pluritemporality, the, the heterogeneity of time, the difference, the different kinds of time. I will not get into a philosophical discussion on what time is, or even a philosophical discussion about whether time exists at all. Uh, if I speak to my physicist friends, they'll tell me that, look, there's irreversibility as a principle of thermodynamics. Uh, but we humans often experience that irreversibility as time, as the passage of time. So I'll take that human experience for granted, uh, the sense of past, present, future, uh, and therefore speak to a almost commonsensical sense of time, not a deeply philosophical sense of time, but a sense of time we all inhabit, which kind of informs the, the notion of chronopolitics. Uh, and what I want to do is to actually connect, both talk about the connections between climate change and the pandemic, that they owe themselves to sim the same developments in history, the pandemic and the climate change, but they produce very different kind of chronopolitics, uh, as it were. And, and in a sense, you could, you could say that our present is actually filled, actually is full of these different kinds of chronopolitics because these are events that are coeval in some respects, definitely overlapping. We are going through disasters being produced by climate change. We're going through disasters produced by the pandemic. The pandemic itself has something to do with climate change and they both have something to do with larger uh, situations of human history. So I will initially talk about these connections. And, and then from there on, go uh, and talk about uh, the difference of the, the, the heterotemporality that emerged, that the scene that emerges out of these two uh, phenomena. And then I recently wrote to Kathleen that I've been thinking about her book and be thinking about the book post my book. Uh, and I would, I want to touch upon a theme that concerns me and takes us back to Kathleen's extremely generative. And I would say even not fully digested book because it was so rich and so deep in what it had to say uh, on periodization and sovereignty. And, and I would want to discuss with you what the different kinds of difficult forms of sovereignty or impossible forms of sovereignty that, uh, that the contemporary period, periodizing monikers like Anthropocene or planet, planetarity or planetary age uh, uh, seek to address. So, in my work, I, I, when I began to work on climate change, my first published essay was 19, 2009. I obviously, I was very struck by the word Anthropocene and the concept behind it. And, and particularly the idea that human beings had become a geological force, a geophysical force. And the idea that our collective unintended actions were ushering in this new geological epoch called the Anthropocene. Uh, was very much what got me, uh, what shook up my historian, humanist historian's imagination and got me going. But as I think, as I thought more and more about it and still think of it as a problem, I, I find it difficult to use the Anthropocene as a periodizing device for human history. And, and that is for the reason that a geological epoch which is the smallest periodizing unit the geologists, uh, stratigraphers use, usually spans millions of years, tens of millions of years. I mean, if, for instance, the geologists agree to rename the geological period as Anthropocene and argue that we have uh, exited the Holocene, then the Holocene will have been one of the shortest geological epochs, about 12,000 years. But See, given the current situation, the next 12,000 years may well be beyond human history, who knows? <laughs> so to use the Anthropocene as a periodizing device for contemporary human history is to collapse natural history and human history in such a way that it does two things. On the one hand, it acknowledges the natural historical implications of human activity 
or even a human existence in the form uh, of an unperceptible experience in the form of a geophysical force. But it also completely collapses the space of human phenomenology, the question of individual human experience. So I found it more productive to convert the earth system science and the science that generated the idea of the Anthropocene into a study of what were becoming human concerns in the present times. And it was clear that geophysical forces, planetary cycles like the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the hydrological cycle, questions like how long does it take soil to regenerate, 10,000, 15,000 years, how long does it take biodiversity to regenerate after an extinction, millions of years? Now, these questions, which previously belonged to specialist uh, uh, provinces of knowledge, through newspapers, through media, questions of renewable versus non-renewable, which inherently has the difference of between human time and planetary time built into it. All these things are becoming part of everyday concerns, not equally everywhere, not evenly everywhere, because the global is uneven. But I realized that there was probably more reason in saying that we've moved from a global to a planetary age, or we are, as I said, on the cusp of a global and planetary, uh, while granting that the stratigraphers may have entirely good reasons for periodizing the geological time period as Anthropocene. So it, in effect, what I'm saying is that for me, the planetary was the humanist uptake as a humanist historian's uptake of the Anthropocene. Now, <clears throat> and I went into the discussion with the, some of which Kathleen mentioned the distinction between the global and the planetary, which for today's talk, the distinction is not terribly important, uh, except to say, as I said, the global was of human making and humans are the protagonists of the global because we made the global. Uh, the global is basically infrastructural. Uh, the communication technology and other technologies that hold this planet together and that basically give us the, uh, the idea that uh, brings it within our both conceptual apparatus, if not experiential, that we live on a sphere. sphere. And actually what the Zoom platform and other these online platforms have actually shown is how impossible it is for even the technosphere to cover all the time zones on the planets at the same time. I mean, if you actually try to have a seminar with people situated all over the planet, you will find that you're dragging some people out of bed at, at, at unearthly hour, and you're keeping some people from going to bed when it's long past their time to go to bed. And in some ways, the materiality of this fear still is a challenge for the technosphere to completely manage and represent in these forms. But, so, but I would not go very far into the distinction. What I want to draw your attention to is where earth system scientists came together in with the environmental historians like John McNeil and others to name a certain period in global history as the period of great acceleration. Now, actually, I have, I mean, I, I assume that the great acceleration graphs uh, are familiar to everybody. I'm, I could show them. I'm just a little bit of, I'm a technophobe and just uh, don't want to get lost in showing slides. But if there's time, I could go back to those slides. But I, I'm assuming that all of you have seen them. I'll read out some figures instead. Now, people have written about acceleration. Uh, Helmut Rosa uh, writes about acceleration, but a lot of that. What of, he writes about is also not only acceleration objectively, but also the human experience of acceleration of time and other things. What the earth system scientists and historians like John McNeil made, meant by uh, the great acceleration is not so much the experience of acceleration, which eventually happens. I mean, once you have social media, I mean, there is definitely a sense of acceleration, but they were talking about an expansion of the human realm. Uh, in effect, you might say an expansion and acceleration of the demand that human beings made on the biosphere of the, of the earth. In other words, an intensification of the extractive relationship, whether you do it through socialist means or capitalist means, doesn't matter. But, uh, but the, the, so an expansion of the human realm. 
behind the expansion, the key to the expansion was the availability of electricity, which was itself based on the availability of cheap and plentiful energy. In other words, the production of societies that are based on a high level of expenditure of energy. So if tomorrow, if we, even if you moved over to renewable, one condition will have to uh, be met if we want to continue our lifestyles and the way we live, is that even renewable energy will have to be available plentifully and cheaply. And historically, it has so happened, and it's still a large part of the reality, is that fossil fuels provided cheap and plentiful energy. So based on that, the human realm experience, and the reason why it expands, and the reason why it's not addressing so much human uh, experience as such, because these people argued that the uh, exponential rise of the human realm, the expansion of the human realm on several counts, and these are the, what the graphs actually show, in their reckoning, it begins from around 1950. Now, I'm personally slightly younger than India, the Republic of India, and I'm slightly older than people born in 1950. And, and I can say that in my, in my own experience, the 50s were much slower. <laughs> I wouldn't have, if you, if you told me in the, in the 50s, and if I, was, I were old enough to know, like my father, that look, do you know that the human realm is expanding very fast? My father would have probably said, no, no, it's, it's still pretty slow. Uh, so that's why I'm not addressing the question of experience. I'm really addressing the question of data and what happens. So since I'm not showing you the graphs, I'll just give you some figures from these people. Uh, so the 20th century became a time of extraordinary change in human history. The human population increased from 1.5 to 6 billion, nearly four times. So if you think of Homo sapiens have, as having existed for uh, 300,000 years. It took us almost 300,000 years to get to the figure 1 billion or 1.5 billion. And suddenly, boom, we are 6 billion at the end of uh, the 20th century. And we are now almost 8. The world economy increased 15 fold in the 20th century. Energy used increased from 13 to 14 fold. Freshwater use increased 9 fold. Irrigated areas by 5 fold. And add some more dramatic figures. <clears throat> so if you can keep them in your head, the world's urban population increased in the same century by 12.8 times. Industrial output 35 times in the 20th century. Energy use by 12.5 times. Oil production by 300 times. Water use by nine times. Fertilizer use by 342 times. Fish catch by 65 times. Organic chemical production by thousand times. Car ownership increased, increased almost 8,000 times. And of course, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere rose by 30%. If you, I'm not showing you the graphs, but with these figures, if you could resolve them more finely, you will, you will actually find that the graphs become steeper. Uh, that is, they rise even more sharply. From the 1980s on, that is once the Chinese modernization started, I would say from the 1990s when India also expands. And there are some stating statistics that in 2000, in the year 2000, 70% of the world's consumers came from the usual suspect countries, uh, the North Atlantic, Japan, industrialized countries. Now, today, the 70% of world's consumers come from the aspiring countries, India, China, parts of Africa, Brazil, the, those countries. In 2017, a Brookings Institution survey showed that there had been an acceleration of human consumption of resources as well. So it was only around 1985 that the global middle class reached 1 billion people, about 150 years after the start of the Industrial Revolution in Europe. But it only took 21 years until 2006 for the middle class to add a second billion, much of this reflecting the extraordinary growth of China. The third billion was added to the global middle class in nine years. Today, we are on pace to add another billion in seven years and a fifth billion in six more years by 2028. So it's not surprising that in this period, humans also emerged as the biggest geomorphological agent on earth. That is, we are the biggest shapers of the landscape of this planet and of the continental shelves. 
and we move more earth around than all the rivers of the planet do taken together and the other thing that we need i need to mention is uh, the geologist peter half argues the geologist at duke university that the current numbers of human beings could not be sustained if we did not have what he calls the technosphere the technology that connects us all and uh, so he, by his calculation uh, which i'm not in a position to verify but he argues that if you took all the technology out that connects us human numbers would collapse to 11 million so he has a very interesting argument where he says that technology has become the precondition for biology so he asks us to imagine this planet as having the you know the molten core then the lithosphere the rocky planet then the biosphere on the lithosphere which produces life and then of course the atmosphere and the stratosphere but between the atmosphere and the biosphere another thin film that he calls technosphere and even though he's a geologist he almost writes in almost a sentence that reminiscent of you know you think you're reading Nicholas Luhmann or somebody where he says that humans maybe have become the sentient aspect of the technosphere we created it but we are not necessarily in control of it because we our lives depend on it so we have to keep feeding it with energy to keep to sustain our numbers now this extractive relationship so if there was no climate problem no planetary environmental problem no sort of question of the sea levels rising um doing all kinds of damages uh, at a very personal level to human beings in places like even places in india coastal people are already suffering if there were no such bad stories the so called the graphs of the great acceleration would have given you a picture of uh, the world that steve pinker believes in the harvard psychologist because human beings have never lived so well we our numbers have expanded even the poor have uh, longer life spans even though they don't have good lives and the aspiring classes have joined the race for consumption so that's why in the great acceleration graphs when you see these graphs without the graph <laughs> graphs showing how the planet reacts to what humans do you really thought you really think okay this is progress i mean this is exactly what we celebrated we fight for our rights but we fight for equal distribution of these resources so if i go back to the 20th century and at the end of the 20th century the harvard historian um charles meyer was actually he wrote an article for american historical review in 2000 i remember the last issue called consigning the 20th century to history interestingly he had not a word to say about climate change or global warming even though the ipcc had been set up in the late 1980s and james hansen had spoken to the united states politicians about global warming in 1988 uh there was not a word because humanist historians were far more interested in the post colonial questions like i was in the rights question I and mean, the questions haven't gone away and the questions are still with us in the imperial legacy question time chrono politics as part of imperial time the waiting room of history that uh, fernando uh, very kindly mentioned the con- and uh, they're not gone away but they're there but to those concerns have been added a new concern in the 21st century for humanist historians like myself i mean climate scientists have been talking about this from uh from the 1950s at least in the and in, in the anglo sphere in the anglo anglo uh, ever since the second world war because climate science itself comes out of the cold war and the both the american and the soviet interest in atmospheric science because of the interest in in weaponizing weather in military terms space competition and in monitoring uh, the fallout of nuclear explosions which is a kind of the, the, the science comes out of that and earth system science itself is a recent interdisciplinary science nasa set up its first committee on earth system science in as late as 1983 uh, whereas from the 60s of course james lovelock working with carl sagan was about gaia but but in some ways when you look at how the planet has reacted to this expansion of the human realm that's where you begin to get the planetary story the 
increase in the greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide, methane, carbon dioxide, the warming of the seas, the acidification of the seas, all those planetary long-term processes get activated. And one result of that is what we call climate change, global warming. But if you look at what people have written about the pandemic, particularly infectious disease specialists, uh, Anthony Fauci, who was even during Trump's time, his main advisor, wrote an essay last year in September in a biology journal called Cell with his, uh, with his colleague, David Morans, where he was arguing something that actually infectious disease specialists have been arguing for some time, that we have entered what they call an era of pandemics. And one of the interesting facts about the era of pandemics is that in the last 20 years, about 70% of the emerging new infectious diseases are zoonotic diseases. That is, they've come from animals to humans. And they're very clear that a main, the reason, so, so, when the, so humans have had pandemics from the time that there was invention of agriculture and domestication of animals. Again, infectious disease historians point out that when we didn't have vaccinations, we didn't have modern medicine, sometimes took thousands of years for humans to actually come to terms with the bacteria and the viruses they exchange with, with, with animals. Now, of course, the role of the vaccine is to foreshorten that time, kind of get to herd immunity in a matter of one year, two years currently. Uh, but one, so whether it's how you read Anthony Fauci, whether you read UN reports on zoonotic diseases, it's very clear that in the last 15 or so years, we have had five or six near pandemics or potential pandemics and one real one. And when I read that literature, I see that from around 2007, the infectious disease specialists have been fearing a pandemic. In fact, there's a remarkable sentence by uh, an infectious disease specialist that a virologist that David Quammen, the science writer, uh, quotes in his book called The Spillover, because the viruses that jump hosts are described as spillover from one species to another. And then this man was saying that we are waiting for the next big one. And unlike the SARS epidemic, or the old coronavirus, where basically you developed um, you developed symptoms as you got infected. So people knew whether to whether you were a spreader. And they said, they were saying that we'll get the next big one. Well, when we get a virus, which was producing illness, of which the symptoms will not show for a long time, even when you're infectious. And we got precisely that with novel coronavirus, with SARS-CoV-2. But governments were not listening. But what is common to the theories that infectious disease people are saying, uh, the origins of the era of the pandemics, is, the, is also what the great acceleration historians are saying. One of the features, one of the uh, determinants of the, the planetary climate is of course the forest cover. Uh, I read in a science journal that if we cut down the present forest cover by 25%, we're in danger. We are somewhere near 17. And, and the cutting down of forests, the, the destruction of habitat for wildlife, mining in the forests, extension of farmland for biofuel and for human food, extension of human habitations, building roads through forests. There's a fascinating study in, in Ghana of what happens to traditional hunting habits. When you build road in, roads into forests, how circular patterns of hunting become more, more, more linear. So they end up saying, Morris and Fauci, that the cause of pandemics, present day pandemics, the cause of this era are humans. So, so first of all, I want to establish that climate change and pandemic are somewhat different problems, but connected problems. And they both have to do what, 
which is what these people call the great acceleration in the expansion of the, what I'm calling the expansion of the human realm and the destruction of wildlife habitat. And I mean, as you know, in most places in the world, and it, uh, many wild animals are trying to be urban, trying to live in cities. In India, there's so many stories of leopards coming into Mumbai, out of Mumbai and wanting to live urban animals. And they're very fascinating stories with, with those sorts of uh, developments. Now here, <clears throat> then you begin to see while they have the same origins, there are fascinating differences in what you might call the chronopolitics of the two crises. So if you look at, so climate change is a phenomenon. First of all, it's abstract, a scientific proposition, even Earth system science is an abstract scientific proposition. It kind of a Tim Morton term, it's the hyper object. And, and climate change, science says climate change is a certainty, but the certainty is of a probabilistic nature. So all the IPCC statements would be conditional. They would say, if you do not stop producing so much carbon by such and such time, then the probability of temperature, average temperature rising by three degrees or whatever is so much with at such a level of confidence. So when the certainty of an event is statistical, uh, you know, it's like going on a plane and somebody might tell you that, look, the, the chance of this plane crashing is so much, right, is, is this. The event is not a singularity for you. If the plane actually crashes, the probability becomes one. So, in, so because in climate change, the, the prediction is probabilistic, there are bargaining, politics of time is a politics of bargaining for time, right from the individual level to the level of the nation state, to the level of the United Nations. So to give you one example, well, I'll give you three examples, starting with the United Nations. The United Nations was set up as a bargaining platform where most diplomats came to bargain things, assuming that there was in human terms, infinite amount of time at their disposal, or what I call an indefinite amount of time. So if you asked anybody, when would the Palestinians and the Israelis live in peace? They would say, we're working towards it. We can't guarantee them. Or Kashmir question. It, these are all open questions. But when they set up IPCC, and there's an interesting history why IPCC became a UN branch and not a, a global and not a planetary organization. When they set up IPCC, the, all the IPCC statements actually give us not indefinite time, but definite timetables for action. All those probabilistic scenarios say, if you don't buy such date. So the IPCC is asking for synchronized action by nation states, or at least a certain synchronicity to be achieved by a certain date. But what do you see the nation states doing? They bargain for more time. And sometimes here, the, I mean, this is where the post-colonial temporalities kind of flow in. Sometimes the ground on which you bargain for more time is the argument that you've suffered from imperialism, you've suffered at the hands of global capitalism, and therefore you need more time to, to prepare for more help, more time to, to actually get to a point where you can deal with climate change. Um, so, so the chronopolitics is, so the distinction is that whereas with, with the pandemic, you would, a government, in a third world government would use the same argument that we are poor, we are underdeveloped as an argument for immediate admission into the present. So they would say, give us vaccinations now, vaccines now. The distribution of vaccines must not reflect the unevenness of the world. So Biden was criticized for actually pushing through with American vaccinations while not distributing vaccines. He came on uh, in public television and tried to defend himself by saying Americans are giving so many of the vaccines away, blah, blah, blah. But, but you can see that the argument about immediate admission to the present in, in the context of the pandemic 
is the same argument that you would use in the context of the climate change to actually bargain for more time, to delay the, the, the process of a, a kind of an imposition of a global consensus. Whereas with, so because, because the pandemic is a situation of singularity, it has happened. It is not, in 2007, it would have been a statistical probability. Whereas climate change, the nature of climate change such, is such as an event that it's a cascade of events. It's not one single event. And therefore, the, in fact, the probability of it becoming a singularity would mean a huge disaster, like a great sixth grade extinction or something. Short of that, it remains a probabilistic series of uh, announcements and therefore gives rise to a more a different kind of chronopolitics than the chronopolitics of, of, of climate change. The second example is the Paris climate deal, COP, where nations again bargained and, and agreed to have nationally determined, make nationally determined contributions. So no global monitoring, they will decide how much they contributed to the planetary, to the global process, but the entire deal was based on an assumption of a technology that does not yet exist, that by a certain time this century, I forget exactly when, 2070 or whenever, humans would have a technology by which they would actually draw down carbon dioxide in the against greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and sequester it somewhere. Now, we don't yet have this, but so in a way, the, the bargaining was made feasible by gambling on technology. So the deal actually took a gamble on technology. It may or may not happen. This, and, and deeply at the personal level, in my book, I discuss this, the whole question of air conditioners. Now, I give the example of India, I give the example of Delhi, but Delhi represents many of the other, other metropolitan centers in India and, and, and other countries. In China, of course, China is much more air-conditioned than India is. Indian cities are becoming absolutely heat islands. Because in, in some respects, what has also happened, as I was saying, the great extension of, there's a huge wave of urbanization. I mean, some, you know, if Latour spoke about the constitution of the modern, I think we need to talk about the constitution of the hypermodern. The constitution of the urban and technologized modern, because Latour begins with uh, the, the Westerners going to the new world. Now, the demand for, because the cities are becoming unbearably hot, but people are coming into money, the aspirational classes are actually moving up. So even in slums, people pool money and buy air conditioners. Now, Indian air conditioning technology is based on old technology. The liquid used, the coolant used is absolutely damaging for the atmosphere. So the cities actually become hotter. The more new technology air conditioners are more expensive to install, required more skilled labor. And when countries met in Rwanda in 2016 to have a global deal on air conditioning, India bargained hard to be in the last, the slowest circle of countries to change because air conditioning represents the aspiration of the aspirational classes. And when you listen to the human stories, so New York journalists wrote a story about this and I have a colleague, an economist who works on this problem, both in India and, and elsewhere. And he argues that, look, it is, a, it is a proven truth that air conditioning saves lives. The history of air conditioning in Texas is that people have actually been saved from death by the use of air conditioning. The Chinese have, gone in for massive air conditioning. India is trying to go for that. And actual people when interviewed say, it's for the first time that I had good sleep. I'd never had good sleep before because we're eight people in one room. Somebody says it's the first time my children can sit up and prepare for their school exams or medical school exams without getting eaten up by mosquitoes. And you can see the different kinds of trade-offs that are going on. So if I went and asked a Delhi person, do you realize that by buying this air conditioning and you are actually doing a trade-off, you're buying a time for your children to fulfill their aspirations, but the city will be less livable. And their argument will surely be 
that yes, but by the time the city becomes unlivable, my children will have skill, will be skilled enough to move and go somewhere else. So that is a chronopolitics at the domestic family level. And India's national chronopolitics at the, at the Rwanda conference was based on the fact that Indian democracy has to respond, even a Chinese socialism has to respond to the demands of these aspirational classes who are joining the race for consumption, the race for good life, all of those things. So when you look at climate change, um, there is uh, a very different kind of chronopolitics compared to the pandemic. But the pandemic is fascinating. One of the things that these uh, infectious specialists also point out is that <laughs> pandemic also belongs to a Darwinian evolutionary history. Because the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus is evolving. That's why we talk about Delta variant and other variants. The sudden virus is actually, so there is a kind of evolutionary history taking place in front of our eyes, the, a large scale planetary history, but because bacteria and viruses have such short lives that they go through many generations uh, in short periods, so they actually evolve. But the most fascinating thing they point out is that whatever you throw in the path of a bacterium or a virus that you consider your enemy, that very weapon that we're using evolution for that bacterium or the virus. So the, the way you got antibiotic resistant bacteria was precisely by trying to use antibiotics as a weapon in this war. And there are many instances that infectious specialists give actually to show this. And Anthony Fauci and his colleagues, they all point out that there is an evolutionary war going on. They cite a Nobel laureate biologist who says that if you had to write the story of this cohabitation, because you know, we are full of, our microbiome is full of bacteria and viruses, and most of them are commensal. But he said, if you had to write this story of humans and commensal bacteria or, or switchover viruses or bacteria that are hostile to us, quote unquote, you will have to call it a thriller whose title would be their genes versus our wits. And there's no, no guarantee, they say, who will win the evolutionary war because viruses are much older. And, and actually the part of the so-called inferior forms of life who keep, who keep life going on this planet. So, and, and, uh, so when, you, when you look at climate change again, I'm just going between the two topics to compare them to the, the two issues. Climate change raises the question of a planetary governance in a different way. But it's impossible, but the planet proves to be heterogeneous in a very fundamental way. It's plural in a very fundamental way. Even though earth system science actually doesn't use the word systems, it uses the word in, in singular, earth system science. But the planet, even including humans, as Carl Schmitt said a long time ago, human, humanity constitutes a pluriverse, not a universe. So whatever you do, you will have to go through the process of bargaining, the chronopolitics, the process of disagreement. And, and because it is not an event like a singularity, even the pressures of urgency are defined differently. The constraints of time are defined differently. But the planet proves to be itself uh, elusive to the question of sovereignty. And that's sort of how I return to Kathleen's problematic of this question. All these monikers, Anthropocene, uh, the planetary age, they raise this question of who is the sovereign on whose behalf the moniker is being presented. The moniker is being presented on the shoulders of a desire for planetary governments. In the climate case, it comes up in the writings of virologists like Nathan Wolf, who has a book called The Vital Storm, which was written before the pandemic. But if you read it, you'll find, I mean, he, he's a consultant. He used to be a virologist in Stanford, I think. He's now set up, set himself up as a consultant. 
And they have all these plans for a global management of pandemic, which would mean giving more teeth and power to WHO and taking that power away from nation states like China, which is not going to be easy. But their schemes are actually having satellite arrangements for surveillance of pandemic outbreaks anywhere in the world because they have noticed that the telephone chatter goes up when a pandemic breaks out. And they were, and the dream is of setting up a commando-like team globally kind of for some global construction of power that would go right in and contain the pandemic. Now, this is not actually, a, so they assume that we'll keep on cutting down forests, <laughs> that the human realm will keep on expanding, that the consumer classes will keep on expanding. And we'll have to create these kind of global regimes. But this is also a humanity, that human is the pluriverse you know from the anti vaxxers I mean, you don't even have to talk about the unavailability of vaccination. I mean, particularly in America where Kathleen and I are, I mean, there are such resistance to the idea of vaccination, even when it's available. In Chicago, there are vaccination stations where the, the vaccine is available, but no, you know, no one turns up to get them. So, so the pluriverse question comes up, but I think that there's another fascinating question that comes up in the pandemic area as a much more urgent question. It comes up in the climate question as a slower question, but it's a, it, it is right there as an immediate question in the pandemic case, which is the human relationship to the non-human non and the non-human in this case being microbial. Now, what is our relationship to the microbial world? Now, you know, there's been lots written on animal world, bird world. So if you read somebody like Princian Despray, um, this wonderful book she has in translated into English called What Would... So here I am at the end of my 42nd minute, so I will wrap up in, in two minutes. Um, so this book, which is called what, what Would Animals Say If You Could Ask Them the Right Questions? And she has a wonderful essay which is based on the study of uh, baboon society, primate society, but baboons in, in, in South Africa by um, a scientist, uh, Susan Scram, I think, or Scram, her name is. But the whole story is about how the scientists concerned here learned to get accepted by a primate, another primate group, by imitating their behavior and learning to communicate with them. And the same could go for birds and for other, but you know, while we know that bacteria can be social in their own ways, like trees can be, but this immediate access into an imaginative access into the question of being of a chimp or a monkey that is available in the development of ethics in animal studies is not available to us in viral or microbial studies in the same way. And it's very clear, it seems to me often, that if some of the microbes and bacteria we want to hunt down uh, or that we want to retain as friendly, if, we, if they were human beings, we would have to call the knowledge colonial knowledge. Because as it happens, humans are a minority species that whereas the microbial world is the majority form of life. And if you read the science writer, uh, young, I forget the first name, book called um, I Have Multitude in Me, it's about the microbiome. You will again find a very Promethean vision that human science and technology will one day control, these are his words, manipulate uh, this world to create a good life for us. Now, this assumes a kind of global human sovereignty. But given that humanity is a pluriverse, given that we don't enter into relationship with the microbes on the same terms as maybe with animals, I think sovereignty remains a very, very thorny and almost elusive question. But at the same time, uh, just want to end with this, this point that, that, that 
which then you see that while climate change and the pandemic originate from the same set of historical circumstances, the huge acceleration of the rate at which the human realm expands, they produce kind of interesting uh, similarities and dissimilarities on the question of chronopolitics. Uh, because one event is a singularity. The other climate change, we give it a name, but it's a very, it's, it's certainties of the probabilistic kind. And it leaves us with very different sense to our presence. So one could, so in a way, if you look at the pandemic, this is not the presentism that Hart talks talking about. Because here, most imaginations of a post-pandemic future um, makes us wonder whether we are being nostalgic for the future, whether we are actually thinking the future or the past. Whereas the climate vista, the narrative takes its narrative arc from the possibility uh, of the human technology and species and our, our realm causing what may be a sixth six great extinction, but it's both a threatening possibility and one that in temporal scale still feels remote. So that's where I will end. Thank you for your patience. And, and uh, I look forward to your questions if you have any. Thank you.